Well, I'm, thank you. I'm, please welcome the Mayor's um, chaplain who will give some th thoughts. Please be seated. Good evening, friends. Another brief thought from the Quaker tradition to open council meeting tonight. I've already outlined three of the principles that Quakers try to live by. Equality and community, truth and integrity, and being peacemakers. Tonight, we very briefly touch on another one, that of simplicity of living. Simplicity. In the Quaker garden, this idea is depicted by the planting of a simple flower bed that only has green, white, and silver foliage and flowers. And by the way, you're all most warmly invited to come to Snowdrop Day on the 19th of February, and a tea and cake will be provided, and donations will go to the Mayor's Charities. End of advert. <laughs> the idea of living simply is very counter-cultural. As a society, our mindset is fundamentally based on consumerism. We are bombarded with adverts telling us we must have this or that to be fulfilled and happy. We ladies are encouraged to do retail therapy, to lift our spirits. And then there is the alluring lotto tickets that tell us how wonderful it would be to win millions of pounds. The principle of living simply, simply runs totally in the opposite direction. So why do we Quakers feel that simplicity is important? Firstly, Quakers believe contentment comes more through the nurturing of relationships, having satisfying work, fostering a spirituality that encourages us to give to others and which is able to see us through the knocks of life. Secondly, Quakers believe we cannot continue on the path of consumerism if we are to save our world. Using up more and more of the Earth's resources on making more and more stuff is not sustainable. And lastly, living simply means we are able to give more to those in need, helping to even up some of the equalities we see around us. One year in its annual fundraising campaign, Christian Aid encouraged us to live more simply so that others may simply live. That's our thought for this evening. So as I always do, I invite us now to keep a few moments of silence together where maybe you might consider this idea of living more simply. But also, as I say, as a Quaker, we hold in the light, whatever you in understand that light to be, we hold in the light tonight all those who at this moment are finding it hard to simply live, whether that be in war-torn Ukraine with its bombed-out cities, in Afghanistan, in the freezing conditions and scarce resources, in East Africa, in the midst of drought and famine. And then closer to home, those who are finding it impossible to eke out the meagre incomes they have in the midst of continuously rising costs. So let us keep a moment's silence together with those thoughts.
Thank you, friends. Thank you very much for those thoughts. Um, I'd like to welcome all councillors to the meeting. I was going to say welcome those in the public gallery, but it's empty. But um, I would also like to welcome those who may be watching on live stream. Um, I'm going to be chairing the meeting this evening as the mayor is actually on, on a holiday. Um, so I would now like to hand over to um, the um, head of democratic services to go through some housekeeping points. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor, and through you. Can all those present please ensure that all mobile phones are set to silent? In the event of an evacuation, please exit through the doors on both sides of the chamber, following council staff to the assembly point. As per normal rules, if you wish to speak, please ensure that you raise your hand and you'll be invited to address the meeting. The Deputy Mayor has confirmed that he's happy for members to remain seated when addressing the chamber. All votes will be taken via the electronic voting system. If a recorded vote is requested, this will be taken in the normal way. Um, if you wish to raise a point, please raise the pink document on your desks and address the Deputy Mayor accordingly, stating which point you are raising. Finally, I would like to remind members that this meeting is being live streamed, so please make sure that when you speak, you're using your microphone. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, so if we, if we move to the first item on the agenda, are there any, are there any apologies? Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Apologies received from Councillor Dowson, Councillor Lane and Councillor Knight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we now move to agenda item number two. Are there any declarations of interest from any councillors this evening which are n not already recorded separately on, the, on your individual register? Um, Councillor Judy Fox. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, just in case, I'm not quite sure, but um, one of the motions is regarding disability spaces, and I have got a disability badge, so I wasn't quite sure whether I should um, say that. And um, that's that, but, uh, and that's okay. I'm advised yeah. on on that. Yeah. And has anybody else got any declarations of interest? Can't see any. That's okay. So uh, we move on to agenda item number three. Um, I would like to move approval of the minutes from the full council meeting held on the 7th of December 2022. Do I have a second for that? Councillor Fitzgerald. Yes, Mr Deputy Mayor, I'm happy to second that for you. Thank you. Um, so if there is no objection, I'd like to take those as agreed. Agreed, thank you. So, agenda item number four is mayor's an announcements. Um, so, since the previous meeting of full council, the de deputy mayoress and I, and the mayor and and, and mayoress, have opened a, a nicer store in in. And ground, and we've also opened the board game uh, cafe in um, Bridge um, Street. We have attended a number of community events in the lead up to Christmas, and there were quite a large number of these. So you'll be pleased, and I'm not going to go th go through all of them. Um, but I would highlight that we did have the normal Christmas wreath laying service, which took place in Bridge Street on Thursday, the 15th of December. On Christmas Day, the mayor attended the Salvation Army Christmas lunch, and the Salvation Army have asked me to thank all those councillors who made a contribution towards the event, um, which is in addition to the, to the contribution that was made from the mayors and charities. Also on Christmas, on Christmas Day, I attended a free Christmas Day meal that was held at St Mary's Church. The Deputy Mayoress and I went to a Christmas event for Lithuanian families. 
and um, we also attended a, a Lithuanian Defenders of Freedom Day um, event, which was held at Peterborough Museum on the 13th of January, which was attended by His Excellency, the, the Ambassador for Lithuania here. Um, in January, the mayor hosted two receptions in the mayor's parlor. The first of these was for some security um, some um, security um, guards who helped to save the life of a member of the um, public when they used the defibrillator, which is situated outside the town hall. The, the, the other reception was for the Deputy Lord Lieutenant, Mr. Neil McKittrick, to say thank you for his services. We also held a small reception in the Mayor's Parlour to unveil a plaque to, to celebrate the life of former council leader Charles um, Swift. Um, I would also like to, to um, highlight some important events that are coming up. Um, on th Thursday, we have a Holocaust memorial service, which has been held at St. John's um, Church. And, um, then on, and then on Friday, we have a commemoration event in the cathedral for um, Catherine of Catherine of Catherine of Aragon. Um, we're holding a, an, a sort of open day, which is taking place in the reception hall at the town hall on, fr on, fr on Friday, February the 3rd, um, between 11.30 and 1.30. Um, um, please could you, could you pass information about this out to, out to as many of your constituents as you can? Um, it is our intention to support all, all, all the communities across the um, whole of Peterborough and we aim to organise um, things in the mayor's um, parlour to w w welcome people into the, into the town hall. So that's the announcements. And so I would now like to move to agenda item five, which is an announcement from the, from the lead. Councillor Fitzgerald. Uh, um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. As ever, good evening, everybody. Uh, great pleasure to rise uh, again this evening with what has become um, a great uh, feature of the council meetings because generally it's all good news. But I start with some sad news uh, this evening as we uh, say a fond farewell to our executive director for people and communities, Charlotte Black, over there. I'm pointing at her. She's the one smiling. I think she knows she's going, who is leaving the council at the end of the month. Uh, prior to moving to her current position last year, Charlotte had been the Director for Adult Sur Social Services across Peterborough and Cambridgeshire, and that's since 2017, so uh, a challenging role, I'm sure you'll agree. So I'd like to thank her for working tirelessly and professionally during her time with us, supporting the Council to deliver improved outcomes for residents, focusing on early intervention work and prevention, and ensuring personalised care for those with long-term needs. So. I think we'd all wish Charlotte all the best for the future and give her a round of applause, folks, please. But, but knock that off me time. I'd also like to welcome, and he's here somewhere, Simon Lewis, where are you? Uh, is he here? He's probably watching online. Who is our, uh, who joined the council just a, a week or so ago as our new director responsible for commercial partnerships property and assets, and he'll be working with Cecilia and the team. Simon will be developing new arrangements for the services currently or previously provided by NPS, uh, which are due to come back in-house at the end of the month. I think that's actually happened or uh, it's any day now. Now, there is a theme to the rest of my announcements, and it's government money, ka-ching, coming to Peterborough. Uh, last week, of course, 
we received some very exciting news that our £48 million levelling up fund bid for the first phase of redevelopment of the area around the train station has been approved. And again, I want to echo everything I said last week in terms of thanks to all the team here uh, in Peterborough City Council uh, and also Emma G, who moved on to other things, all the team at the Combined Authority, including all the officers there and members of the board, which I, I thanked again today. So a great uh, effort all round and of course to our MP Paul Bristow for supporting it. Now the enhancement of that area will improve rail passenger journeys and encourage more rail travel, which will have a positive economic impact on the city. It will support Peterborough in attracting more knowledge intensive and high level employers through, it tra through its transport link. Peterborough is the gateway to the east of England and the station quarter, the gateway to the city. So it's vitally important that this area in the station itself are fit for purpose. But I want to emphasize, because members of the public think it's about rebuilding the railway or train station, whichever you want to do, it's actually a lot more than that and could run into the hundreds of millions when the private investment comes in. So it's not just about a railway or train station. For the good, in further good news, uh, it slipped under the radar almost. There was a further seven million pounds, four million of which has been secured to relocate Peterborough's bus depot uh, from the area of Millfield at the moment, which I'm sure many members uh, in that area will be pleased about and we'll be talking to you about that as work progresses and what might happen to the site in the future. So you won't be left behind. It's all about electrification of buses and I was talking about that today in the combined authority where Cambridge got yet I think another 30 electric buses which I was very jealous about and I told them so. So we'll catch up at some point. Uh, and the other money was uh, an innovative infrastructure project which will deliver low carbon heat and electrical power was also given the green light uh, by government as well just before Christmas. That's the uh, PIRI project. You may have heard about that. So that's 14.5 million of government funding. We're well on the way to the city becoming one of the first carbon zero cities of the future. The investment doesn't end there though. NHS England is making available a new 200 million pound fund to support integrated care boards to move more medically fit patients from hospitals into community care settings. I know many of you, including uh, Sam, will be very passionate about that. Uh, this is to free up hospital beds and uh, Dr. Kaim as well will also be equally as excited by that. Uh, we've received 2.9 million at the Cambridge Peter ICB uh, and we've all was worked hard with our acute hospitals to ensure timely discharges and perform well and we expect that to continue. Our domestic abuse service has also been awarded government funding so that we can continue to provide the vital support to help protect people from harm and provide a pathway to a safer life. We'll get 488,271 in the next financial year and a further half a million pounds for 24-25. COVID-19 has made it harder, of course, to, uh, for many businesses to make ends meet. Thanks to government funding, we've handed out millions of pounds to businesses since the pandemic again pandemic began helping them to weather the storm. Now, you'll be aware, many of you, if you keep up, that in this area, we were the only local authority to distribute 100% of our funds to support businesses across Peterborough, which hadn't received any other form of rates-related relief. Nearing the end, nearly £5.7 million of business rate savings was handed out to 183 businesses, uh, as I said, makes us the only local authority in Cambridgeshire to get 100% of its funds to the right hands. And finally, uh, many will know that I host a monthly online Ask the Leader uh, question, uh, question and answer session. So you're invited to tell your friends and family about that and you can just register to ask uh, me anything you like at asktheleader at peterborough.gov.uk. I also did a similar thing on Radio Cambridgeshire on Monday, and that's available to listen back. Deputy Mayor, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald, for that. And we now come to the point where opposition group leaders have one minute in which to respond. So we'll, we'll take them in order. Councillor Shazna. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I'll start by echoing and extending my thanks to Charlotte Black. I've enjoyed working with her and I had the pleasure of meeting Simon Lewis uh, yesterday afternoon, in fact, and he's very enthusiastic and ambitious and uh, I, I, I'm confident we'll see a huge improvement uh, in our commercial and procurement area. 
Uh, the, the 48 million pound bid, of course, it's welcome. I think the station quota, if I may say so, uh, looks quite dated and uh, that investment will be most welcome. Uh, I am a bit surprised because I was expecting the leader to pull out a big cheque and wave it around, but he he's not done that because I think Paul Bristol probably left it on his pub, pub crawling gun thobe somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yet to be, yet to be found. Uh, but uh, and and the check. Uh, I think it's, it's also important, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, to say that the North Westgate area also needs significant improvement in, in, in order to improve the entire area. Uh, and I'm and I'm sure we'll see that develop further. The four million pound is extremely welcome news uh, because I represent part of that ward, and I know Central Ward, North Ward, and Park Ward councils have worked very hard alongside officers, uh, and I know the residents and businesses in that area uh, will welcome that news uh, without doubt. Uh, and Could you I, draw your remarks to a close? I, I will, and I want to thank the Metro Mayor, obviously, for making both those happen alongside, alongside officers and the board and everybody else. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Councillor Hogg, would you like to respond to the leaders and announcements? With pleasure, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor. Uh, so, um, speaking for the Liberal Democrat group, um, we're really sorry to see Charlotte Black leave. She's been a great asset to the Council during her time here, and I'm sure we will all be sad um, to see her go. Um, I welcome the, uh, the arrival of Simon Lewis, and I have high hopes that he will be able to sort out our stagnated community centres and get appropriate outcomes for the operators um, so that they're able to move forward with plans and attract much needed grants to be able to achieve them. Um, it is great to see that we've been able to attract funding uh, for Peterborough. We need to invest in transport that is more sustainable, so the upgrades to both train and bus services are most welcome. Um, I have to say the announcement of the uh, 48 million uh, for the train station was tinged uh, with some um, blatant um, electioneering and feel that it, it shouldn't just be laid at the door of officers uh, for the video that had to be taken down. And I would hope the leader um, would take this opportunity to apologise for his part in that debacle. Um, it is regrettable that our Peterborough MP uh, not only feels that he didn't overstep the mark with his Tory brandy. Councillor Hart, could you draw your remarks to a close as well? Really? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. His, uh, his Tory branded check, uh, and he has doubled down by doing a pub crawl uh, accompanied by said check. Maybe his colleague for Northwest Cams can have a word with him about how to deport himself. So, okay. I think, we, I think we've got the point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, Councillor Harper, would you like to, to respond? Uh, yes. Excuse me. Uh, thank you. It's all right. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, I think most of it's been said. Of course, uh, we wish Charlotte all the best in the future. We wish her the very best of success, health and happiness. We welcome Simon. We wish you again every success in your new role. Uh, whilst all the investment that, that uh, the leader has as spoken about, is extremely welcome to our city, and we do need it, and we do need to grow. It's the way forward. We mustn't forget that this comes on the back of many years of the council grant being severely cut uh, and cuts in services. And I hope, as well as doing these investments, we can find a way, or the government can find a way to find its moral compass again and start funding local councils accordingly. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Harper, particularly for being concise and keeping within the time. Um, Councillor Councillor Nicola Day, would you like to respond? Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. I want to echo those thanks to Charlotte and to welcome Simon. As Greens, we are delighted to see that we have been awarded the 14.5 million of government funding to become one of the first zero carbon cities of the future. We know that this will not only make us more resilient in the future, but it will also put us forward as a city to become one of the first to decarbonise and we can become a beacon of best practice to others. We're also pleased to see the funding to relocate the bus depot and begin the electrification of buses. We very much welcome such environmentally and sustainable transport in the city. It's exciting to see government funding for an infrastructure project to deliver low carbon heat and electrical power, and we very much welcome the funding to the domestic abuse services to provide vital support to protect people from harm.
I also want to welcome Councillor Imtiaz Ali to the Green Group. We look forward to working with him in the future. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, I've also had a request from Councillor Howard as a Cabinet member who would like to say a few words, and, and I'm happy for him, to, for, him to, for him to say something, so thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, Charlotte, just want to say thank you on behalf of myself and for, I'm sure, I'll speak on behalf of previous Cabinet members who've had the pleasure to work with you as well. Um, really appreciate your help, guidance, support in what is a very complex portfolio. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. My only regret was that it wouldn't have been for longer. So wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. So that, that concludes that item. Um, we now move to agenda item six, questions with, with notice by members of the public. Um, we, we've actually got got just one question before, before us. Um, you may note that there was a question on the order paper from a Mr. Simeo, and, um, but unfortunately he isn't able to attend, so he will be coming to a subsequent meeting to put his question. Um, so we turn to question two in the paperwork. Mr. Turner, would you like to ask your question in, in, in respect to solar power? Uh, thank you. Um, I, my name is Barry Turner, and uh, I, I live in Orton Waterville. My question is, Peterborough Council has declared a climate emergency in 2019 and has committed to zero carbon by 2030. There are opportunities for residents to contribute towards this at little cost to the public purse. For example, by installing double glazing, better insulation, installing heat pumps, switching to electric vehicles, and installing solar panels. The recent exponential rise in energy costs has transformed the economics of installing domestic solar vo photovoltaic power, and rising inflation has further added to this. These installations can be up and running within a matter of months. Will the Council urgently review its policies and remove obstacles it imposes on solar energy and enable more residents to generate their own electricity and also to allow the supply of low-cost electricity to the grid for other users? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Councillor Marco Soresti, as the Cabinet Member, would you like to respond to, to the question? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Turner. Um, first of all, I'm not aware of any obstacles that the Council puts in front of people wanting to use solar panels. Uh, and uh, if there are obstacles, then please make me aware of them. Uh, the Council is committed to supporting the city to reduce carbon emissions to net zero. And part of that means supporting renewable energy generation. We do have to act within the law, and much of this is set by central government. The government takes the view that renewable energy generation will not always be appropriate. And for example, solar panels are not generally allowed on listed buildings. The council works with owners of all properties to achieve the best outcome wherever possible. And it is not always possible to please everybody. We are legally obliged to follow government rules. We do recognise the need to keep our policies up to date and to that end, the proposed local plan review offers an excellent opportunity to review our planning policies to support renewable energy generation and this process is due to formally start in April. And thank you for that response. Mr Turner, do you have a supplementary question that you would like to put? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, I would point out what my position is. Uh, I'm currently in the, installing solar panels on our south-facing roof, which has an, a 45-degree slope. Uh, we, we could produce 7,500 kilowatt-hours of electricity per annum with this installation. 
but the projected uh, actual output is only going to be 5,000 kilowatt hours per annum. We aren't certain yet. The loss is due to shading from a band of council trees which are within three metres along the south and east borders of our property. The, um, some of the uh, trees are up to 15 metres tall and they're nearing maturity after some 30 or 40 years of growth. Uh, and just taking a couple of examples of comments in your tree policy, they include things like to plant the right tree in the right place um, allowing for space for the tree your, and its roots. Could you draw your remarks to a close? You've, you've only got one minute that, and you've... And you've uh, no, there's um, no trade. Uh, uh, my first question is quite brief. Could I not add... To, well, I could, if, may I have a few more moments? Um, yes, if, if you could just be as, be as okay. concise as you can. Then. Right. Right. Well, I, I was going to quote you some of your comments, but what you did say was you need to do things differently. You need to be committed to taking action and you need to demonstrate leadership in climate action. And all I would say is, I would request that your policies are reviewed to be more uh, uh, helpful towards residents like myself who wish to generate solar power, some of which could be exported to the grid and will add to uh, the reduction of CO2. Thank right, you. okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, Councillor Sarasti, would you like to respond to the supplementary well, question? Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm completely committed to everything that uh, Mr. Turner has said, and so is the council. Uh, I'm not quite clear what he wants us to do, but if Mr. Turner would like to write to me personally, I will have a look at what he, has, he would like us to do to help his situation. Thank you very much. That would be helpful, I'm, I'm sure. So um, if we move to item agenda item number seven, which is per... per, per Petitions. Um, anybody presenting a petition will have one minute to outline their request. So, have we received any petitions from members of the public? No, I don't think we have any. Um, are there any petitions that councillors would, would like to put forward? I'm not seeing anybody's hands going up, so I'm assuming that's not the case. Okay, right, so we moved to agenda item eight, which is questions on notice. There have been six member six questions submitted by councillors, and um, all the questions have been published. So we'll adopt our normal procedure as just taking them as read. Um, so if we go to question one, Councillor Marco Soresti, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Heather Skip Skipstead in relation to parking for users of the of the regional pool? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Um, our new university, as you very well know, is developing at a pace. And with the first teaching block opened in September, the new research and innovation building now complete and building work on the second teaching block about to start. It is a fantastic achievement and something that we should all be proud of and we have long waited for. It is unfortunate that one of the unintended circumstances of the development is the loss of the regional pool car park or just a small part of it. However, alternative parking arrangements uh, most definitely will be put in place to ensure that regional pool users are not inconvenienced, not inconvenienced at all. Alongside the use of the Bishop's Road car park, which is just a, a minute or so away from the regional pool car park, we will be providing new spaces on the site of the regional pool itself, including parking bays for disabled drivers and new additional temporary parking will be provided very close by to the pool, to the pool building, the details of which will be shared in the uh, upcoming days. The time tell timetable for completing the new building is governed by the funding being used to deliver it and so delaying the start of the building is not possible. However, given that there should not be any significant gap between the closure of the regional pool car park and the provision of new parking bays, 
This will not be necessary. Thank you, Councillor Sarasti, for that response. Um, Councillor Skepster, do you have a supplementary question that you would like to ask? Yes, I do. Thank you, Deputy. Um, I'm glad that solutions are being considered. Um, I'm still very concerned as a councillor and user of the pool that moving the car parking arrangements further away will mean that people will not be able to access it as easily and this will detract from usage, um, especially families, elderly, users of the athletics tract and so on. I'm aware that staff have targets to meet for usage which will be affected and I've recently spoken to members who are intending to cancel their memberships because of this issue. Um, can I have assurance that, uh, I, know, I can understand you're saying that there are various plans put in place, but can I have an assurance that a long-term solution will be considered to, to create a car park that will ensure the regional pool is fully accessible to all, will attract new users, which I'm sure we all wish to happen, and thereby ensure the health and well-being of our citizens, and particularly those who are less mobile. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Seresti, would you like to respond to the supplementary question? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. I, I can assure you that actually it is not the case that people will have to walk further or, and it is not the case that they're going to be inconvenienced. Much of the disabled, new disabled bays will be even closer to the regional pool than they are now, and we will be creating more space, more spaces on the existing car park. However, we will also be creating more space on a temporary car park very close by until the future is clear as to what we're going to do for the city and the pool. Thank you very much. I'd um, like to move to question two. Councillor Howard, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Hemraj in relation to the pressures on social care? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Hemraj, for the question. Um, I know it's well documented. The pressures on our local hospital continue due to increased demand and the number of people presented at the emergency department requiring admission. There are multiple factors that have contributed to the difficulties managing patient flow, patients admitted versus patients being discharged, and increasing numbers of flu and COVID cases through the winter have also contributed. The current position for adult social care changes daily. However, the average snapshot taken on Friday the 20th of January was there was zero delays waiting for reablement at home. There was five packages of care which had been commissioned for people not yet medically fit for discharge, and four packages were being commissioned for people who had just become medically fit for discharge, but only just referred to adult social care within the last 24 hours. The current and historic position for adult social care discharges in the city is, is good, especially given the time of year with the increased demand and staffing pressures in social care. Currently, there are 165 vacancies nationally as reported by Skills for Care. The transfer of care team continue to work in partnership with the Acute Trust and review all medically fit patients on a daily basis to agree the correct pathway for discharge. I hope this assures you there are no delays caused by the work of this council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Um, Councillor Hammeraj, do you have a supplementary question? I do. I look after many patients at the hospital and the frustrations I hear from them is waiting to go home because they tell me personally they're waiting for care packages. I'll come in the next few days and the same patient is still there. So what I see at work is totally different to what you're telling me here. So... I would like to see some truer figures. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Howard, you'd like to respond to this supplementary Cal question? Councillor Hemraj, you have to consider at the local hospital that obviously there are patients there from many different local authorities. They will all have their own different discharge procedures. They'll all have their own different pressures. So the assurances I'm giving you are specifically on Peterborough City Council. There are other councils that aren't in as fortunate a position as we are on, on the matter, I have to say. And obviously, you are experiencing that firsthand, but the figures I've given you are specifically for people who live in the authority area. And on that side, I hope it assures you we are performing very well. Thank you. I'd um, like to move to question three. Councillor Allen, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Chris Wiggin in relation to antisocial behaviour? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Wiggin, for your question. 
Um, the Safer Peterborough Partnership has an active problem-solving group which allows for multi-agency approach to tackling antisocial behaviour, recognising that many of the reported issues cannot be resolved by any one agency. Through this forum, we are making excellent progress to coordinate joined-up interventions that address ASB. This financial year, a total of 91 case reviews have been carried out, centred around protecting the vulnerable, supporting victims and identifying appropriate interventions against perpetrators proportionate to the extent of their antisocial behaviour and crimes. For example, this has included closure orders, prosecutions, uh, referrals to support services, together with public space protection orders, landlord enforcement of tenancy breaches associated with ASB, community protection warnings and notices, as well as deterrent activities such as patrols and enforcement at hotspot locations. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Chris Wiggin, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank Councillor Allen for his response. Um, and for detailing the work that's being done, that doesn't match the public perception that I'm getting from my residents who do not think that anything is being done in certain areas. And there have been several high profile incidents recently where antisocial behaviour is causing problems for the city, such as um, causing the removal of the e-bike scheme, um, the putt stars issue, which um, Councillor Stevenson has referred to in her question, uh, lots of graffiti around the city and other issues. Um, what more can we do to reassure our residents that um, that we are as part of the multi-agency response on their side? Thank you. Councillor Allen, I'd like to respond to a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Wiggins, for the follow-up. Um, we all want a safe and inviting city without perception of no-go or dangerous areas. The Safer Peterborough Partnership works hard to ensure that outcome with the coordinated input of a number of agencies. And I'm sure we all think that the police should be here, there and everywhere. There are revenue issues and there are capacity issues. In turn, I think we have a responsibility as councillors uh, to ensure uh, that false perceptions are not propagated. And I think we all want to be on board with that whilst ensuring that the Safety Peterborough Partnership do the work that they should be doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, we now move on to question number four. Um, Councillor Allen, again, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Stevenson in relation to behaviour reported at the Putt Stars in Queen's Gate? Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. And uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Stevenson, for your question. The ASB issues at Putt Stars have been discussed at the Safer Peterborough Problem Solving Group and we are committed to support the business run as a safe and welcoming operation that enhances our city. To achieve this, officers from the council are facilitating an extraordinary multi-agency problem solving group on the 26th of January. Uh, the meeting will bring together relevant partner agencies, including representatives from Potstars and Queensgate, which as you say are private businesses, but they have to be on board with the solution. And the idea is to discuss actions that can be undertaken to reduce the level of incidents at this location. Thank you, Councillor Seamson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Um, Councillor Stevenson, do you have a supplementary question? Yes, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Allen, for your response. I just wondered, did the police work with the council when uh, preparing their statement? And um, if they didn't, could they be encouraged to do so in the future? Thank you, Councillor Allen. I could say yes, but I'll also elaborate. Um, the future success of shopping malls is pre predicated on mixed leisure use. It's essential that incidents of ASB are addressed at this early stage of the transformation of Queensgate if the centre is to re-establish itself as a family destination for our residents and for visitors to the city combining shopping, cinema and leisure. And importantly, that footfall is not diminished by the actions of a few. We do need uh, to have... Uh, Parents taking responsibility, as the start of your question mentioned. Uh, so do education establishments, ensuring that respect and decent behaviour is a given. However, that course needs to be backed up by an understanding the venue, the centre, has effective stewardship in place. 
The change of business model from shopping to leisure and entertainment clearly has different control requirements, and we sympathize with the police in helping those businesses ensure that outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Um, so we move to question five. Councillor Coles, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Stevenson in relation to the voter identification? Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Stevenson, for your question. The Elections Act of 2022 has brought in changes to the voting system, requiring anybody wishing to cast their votes in a polling station to show photographs, sorry, photographic ID before they're given a ballot paper. This will take effect from the 4th of May 2023. The Electoral Commission are fronting a national campaign to get this message across. And if you go to the Election Commission website, you'll be delighted to hear that there's a specific area of information for disabled people, gypsy, roma and traveller communities, older people, people experiencing homelessness, people who are registered to vote anonymously, and trans and non-binary people. So there's quite a bit of um, material there for people who perhaps need to be communicated in different ways. There's a national campaign. Some of you may have seen the, the um, adverts that are going out currently across social media and, and on, on the main broadcast media. Um, Peterborough City Council will be supporting this campaign with targeted social media posts, leaflets at community hubs, and more informative poll cards that will list the full requirements of voters. Full details can be found on the Council's website, including how to apply for a free voter authority certificate that can be used for anybody who does not currently have a suitable photographic ID, and those that are suitable are currently listed on the gov.uk website. The Electoral Services team will also be working closely with Peterborough's Disabilities and Older People's Advisor, his Councillor Brian Tyler, to my left, to discuss ways in getting the message across to all electors within the city in readiness for May's elections. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Coles. Councillor Stevenson, do you have a supplementary question? I do. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Coles, for your answer. Um, I'm one of those who has neither a driving licence nor a passport, so I'll be one of those needing one of those user authentication certificates that we're going to have to make sure um, people know about. Um, I was wondering then, um, once we've had the elections in May, if there is a drop in turnout, uh, what will the council be doing to examine the reason for that and to find out whether disabled people in particular have been the ones who've become disenfranchised? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Coles, if you'd like to respond to the supplementary question. Thank you very much for your supplementary. Of course, we'll be looking at what the results show us. I think one of the areas to, to also emphasise is that if you want to, you can elect to register to vote by post or by proxy. So you don't necessarily have to get the voter ID to do that. And I hope that all members here and all candidates likely to stand in the next elections will be promoting this as they put up their electoral material to make sure that we can encourage as many people as possible to vote. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Coles. Um, Councillor Sarasti, would you like to respond to the question from Councillor Chris Wiggin in relation to the energy from waste plant? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Um, PIRI is an amazing, innovative scheme. And whereas most low carbon energy schemes focus only on single energy requirements, i.e., heating, power, or mobility, PIRI seeks to identify opportunities to bring forward all of these things simultaneously. This means achieving complementary benefits that would not be realized if these interventions were developed singly as individual projects. PIRI is designed to be technology agnostic. This means that the focus of PIRI is on the enabling infrastructure, the network required to connect a source of power to an end user. This allows the scheme to remain flexible enough to incorporate a range of heat or energy sources, including new technologies that may not be currently available. Perry looked at all potential sources of power at the outset of the project. The energy from waste plant offers the greatest potential for both heat and electricity. Its location close to local businesses and in council ownership 
made it clear that there was an obvious solution. However, the technology agnostic approach and focus on enabling infrastructure means that other options can still be included, such as water source heat pumps, of course, given the proximity to the River Neen, other types of heat pumps and waste heat from other industrial processes in the area. This creates future expansion potential and long-term resilience without full reliance on EFW. The Piri design also incorporates thermal and battery storage options to take advantage of times when supply exceeds demand, ensuring that nothing ever goes to waste. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Sresti. Councillor Chris Wiggin, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I uh, thank Councillor Sresti for his detailed answer, which I think was a very long-winded way of saying yes. Um, my understanding was in 2021, the energy from waste plant was down for 41 days. Um, so just to confirm that... Um, uh, the council is confident that the Piri scheme will be able to make up for that kind of um, loss of supply from the energy from waste plant. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wiggin. Councillor Swestley, if you'd like to respond to that supplementary question. Uh, uh, thank, thank you again, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor. Yes, I'm confident that we'll be able to do that. Okay, for a very concise response, thank you. Um, right, there have been, so that concludes the questions from councillors uh, um, to members of the cabinet. Um, there have been no questions submitted by councillors to representatives of the combined authority, so we can move on. And we now move on to our agenda item 9A in relation to the review of the local plan. Councillor Sorresti, would you like to move the recommended dictations? Uh, uh, th thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, I'd just like uh, Council uh, to authorise the commencement of a review of the Peterborough Local Plan and approve the timescale for the production. Uh, the current local plan was adopted in July 2019 and sets the growth targets and policies all the way to 2036. However, national policy requires that local plans should be reviewed every five years. We are now at a point whereby it is appropriate for the Council to decide whether the time is right to commence a review. Peterborough is a fast-growing city, both in terms of people, jobs and investment, so it is important that we continue to plan long-term to attract new jobs, businesses and investment to our wonderful city. And that means keeping our local plan up to date. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Nigel Simons, would you like to second the recommendation and either speak immediately or reserve your right to speak? Yeah, I'm happy to second and I reserve my right to speak. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And can I call upon any other speakers. Um, Councillor Nicola Day. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Uh, we as Greens support the revision of the local plan. Um, we feel it is useful to review given the changing times we live in and that the priorities can often alter. As Greens, we feel this is particularly important given we declared a climate emergency in 2019 and now have a climate change and environment scrutiny committee, a growing climate change team on the council, and as mentioned earlier in the leader's speech, are now attracting millions of pounds of funding to move our city to zero carbon. And we must ensure a revised local plan is both bold and ambitious, ambitious in reaching these targets. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chris Wagon is next. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, the Liberal Democrat Group also welcomed the uh, review of the local plan. Um, like to endorse what Councillor Day has just said, we completely agree that we need to look at our local plan in terms of our climate commitments. Uh, we won't get to zero carbon at all, never mind by 2030, if we don't review um, 
how we are building um, and many other facets that come as part of the climate change portfolio. Uh, we also can look at other things that will benefit our city, such as living standards. Um, so for instance, how bigger property should be when it's built so that people aren't living in tiny boxes um, and suffering from that aspect. Um, so yeah, there's plenty we can do to uh, improve the plan we've got now and we look forward to contributing to that process. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I've got a list now. I've um, got Councillor Ansar Ali, Councillor Jamil and Councillor Harper. So we'll, we'll go to Ansar first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, like uh, colleagues have said previously, I welcome uh, uh, this review of the local plan. Uh, as all of you know, I represent North Ward, uh, an urban area of the city uh, built uh, over 150 years ago. Uh, it says in Section 5.1 of the corporate strategies in the report, uh, that uh, it is to maximize economic growth and prosperity in an inclusive and environmentally sustainable way and create healthy and safe environments where people want to live, invest, work, visit and play. I'm disappointed to say I have raised this many times and what I would like to see when we are reviewing this that we also look at the challenges that we have within urban areas like the North Ward. Thank you, Councillor Ali, for that contribution. We'll now go to Councillor Jim Hill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, certainly on this side of the chamber, the Labour Group echoes what's been said by just about everyone so far. We look forward to seeing the uh, detail for the Peterborough Local Plan. Um, and in some respects, I think, you know, 2030 is fast approaching and beyond. So hopefully what we will get will be for the children of 2030 and beyond. So I will say that proof will be in the pudding, but we welcome it and look forward to it and look to contribute to it. Thank you, Councillor Jamil. We'll now go to Councillor Harper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. I won't uh, labour what's, what's already been said. I agree with all that. Um, it's important that we look to our land supply for so we don't get um, unsuitable developments in the future because we haven't got that uh, adequate land supply for housing and indeed industrial etc and commercial development but can I just urge everybody here all councillors to make sure you get involved in this plan when it starts coming through you look for your allocated land and you get your residents to look I'm not asking you to suck eggs I'm asking you to make sure you're involved as planning chair for many years Things have come before us before, and the land is allocated, uh, but the residents don't realise it's been allocated three or four years ago. It's important if you want to protect it that you make sure that residents know you and the council knows you protect it and you get it in the plan. Okay, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much for those points. M. Chiaz Ali is the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, I too welcome the uh, the revision of the local area plan. I think as a councillor, sometimes it's quite frustrating when you're trying to get things done and you have to refer to a, an area a local area plan that you had no involvement in when it came through so this gives everyone an opportunity um, one of the advantages mentioned in there was uh, potentially looking for new employment sites and i would just highlight that it's all fine we're looking for new employment sites but we also need to have a consistent transport policy possibly the introduction of bus routes to these new employment sites to to mitigate any traffic implications um, and then finally, just um, in terms of public engagement, there's two phases of public engagement and, and I welcome the fact that we stuck with two rather than go with the one. Uh, but I would emphasize that the communication to the public needs to be very well coordinated. We really need to avoid management speak. We need to make the communication accessible to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Hogg. Uh, I'll try and be brief. I know I, I, I tend to say that every time I, I stand up. Um, so I agree uh, wholeheartedly with everything that, that has been said um, up to this point. 
Um, and I, I just wanted to just also add on to that um, sort of wish list, as it were, um, to, to make sure that we're, we're putting in better standards uh, than we've previously done. Maybe sort of learning some of the lessons from some of the more modern estates uh, with with parking problems, with uh, houses of uh, multiple occupancy, um, dealing with um, uh, charging for, for electric vehicles, if not putting in uh, charges themselves, certainly having the infrastructure put in place so that can be retrofitted after, um, uh, in, subsequently as and when it's needed. Um, I, I think, you know, we need to take this opportunity to, to, to not just look at, you know, the minimum standard that's required and look to see if we can beef up things so that it, it is a much higher standard so that Peterborough gets a better deal uh, than maybe it would do if we just left it unsaid. Thank you. Right, okay, I've got Councillor Fitzgerald and then Councillor Casey, so we'll go to Councillor Fitzgerald first. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Just, I, w I wasn't going to speak, but just to offer words of reassurance to members across the Chamber. Um, about six months ago, I requested that officers kickstart this process again. Uh, my colleague Peter Hiller did a great deal of work on the local plan and should be commended for the one we've got. Um, but it is now getting to the stage where we do need to review for all sorts of reasons, um, and I was encouraged to hear Councillor Harper talk about growth earlier and how important that is to the city, and it's something I've been said, particularly those that will have been shared the financial figures about our reliance on council tax versus revenue support grant that's gone from 55 million to 12 million. Um, and if you haven't been availed of those figures, I suggest you do. So our growth, both in um, housing, which we've done particularly well at, is a very important important uh, but our growth in employment land and I think the council has accepted again it's a really good thing that we've done so well uh, and a lot of the previous allocated land got used up quite quickly so it is time to review it but uh, I'm reminded um, that the local plan has a huge engagement process with uh, the public developers statutory consultees plus it looks specifically at infrastructure and environmental, environmental aspects and design standards. And one of the things that we've taken account of, but it's become uh, more important and been given a higher profile internationally and nationally, is indeed our climate change agenda and making things more sustainable, greener, cleaner, and we're always aspiring for better standards in housing and schools and all those other things come into the mix. And uh, Councillor Harper, again, is right that public must be engaged in terms of when sites come forward, which is always one of the most controversial aspects of any local plan. But all I would say is, look, let's have a open, honest, transparent look and listen to all of the views of people and take forward a new plan because it's going to take about three years folks to get to where we need to um and we'll all have a say on it and so will the public thank you mr deputy mayor thank you councillor Fitzgerald. now move to councillor casey thank you mr deputy mayor I, I think one of the things that i'd like to flag up about the the timeline and the public engagement is that the public engagement tends to happen in july and august or june and august and that's a time when most of the general public are thinking about different things so if some leeway could be given perhaps to extending it at, and some investigation made to the best times to engage with the public i think july tends to be a time when people go away on holiday and if there are any sort of times when and august as well if there are any times when these set piece presentations are made they're not going to be there so I'm, I'm just sort of flagging that up as a potential danger to um to non-engagement thank you very much councillor underground refuge collection as well thank you councillor simons um councillor marco Soresti, would you like to sum up mm -hmm. uh, thank you mr deputy mayor I, i'm delighted to hear the uh, comments made around the room uh, i think we all we all echo those sympathies um, i think from a personal point of view I, I continue to quote mark twain and that is that i'm very very interested in the future because i want to live there and and 
and and I think that applies about with the local plan. We all want to live in a, a great city that delivers all the things that we aspire to deliver, and we can only do that if we've got the right strategy in place. And the local plan is one of those strategies. Th th I recommend it to the council. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Sarasta. I haven't heard anybody opposing the local plan, so can we take it that it's agreed? Agreed, thank, thank you. Right, um, so we now move on to agenda item 9B, which is in relation to licensing schemes. Councillor Soresti, would you like to put the recommendations forward? Once again, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, this report outlines an approach to improving housing standards and compliance in the private sector in our city. The council is responsible for enforcing, undertaking and administering a range of functions to maintain and improve housing conditions in the private rented sector. There are various tools available to the council to enable it to fulfil its housing duties, including enforcement, powers, penalties, housing health and self safety rating systems and licensing schemes. Though, the, though these are well maintained, proper, those, though, the, forgive me, Mr. Mayor, uh, though there are very well maintained properties and mobile homes in the city, all offering good living conditions, there are also properties that put the welfare and health of those that live in them at risk. We need, to, we need improvement to bring them up to acceptable standard. I recommend it to council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Coles, would, will you second the recommendation and either speak now or reserve your right to speak later on? Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Indeed, I second the motion and reserve my right to speak later. Thank you very much. Can I call upon anyone else who would like to contribute? In which case, um, Councillor Lucinda Robinson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to read this report, but I did want to say it's a disappointment that more of um, the city, particularly my ward, was not included in the selective licensing scheme. Um, though there are lots of privately rented and ageing housing in uh, West Town and North Ravensthorpe. I raised this in the meeting we had on the subject in 2022, but apparently these areas are victims of where the boundaries of LSOAs lie, with there being many... Um, own salubrious houses down the road influence the average. So I'd like to take this opportunity to urge the Cabinet to take up the option mentioned in the report of additional licensing schemes for these areas, where private houses can also be blighted frequently by poor standards, e.g. the prevalence of black mould, which has now been proven to be a risk to health, which some private landlords in my ward have failed to act upon. So I look forward to a decision on these ALSs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor M. Chiaz Ali. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I think we, the Greens, are very supportive of, of this paper and also any kind of uh, improvement in standards to housing will always support those. Um, however, there is there are three paragraphs in here which cause me a little bit of concern. 4.3.6 uh, to 4.3.8 talk about outsourcing of the administering of the selective licensing scheme to an external provider. Um, have we not learned our lessons from the outsourcing of property valuations to MPS? Have we not learned our lessons from the outsourcing of procurement to Serco? We can't, in good faith, say this is a cost-neutral scheme when we have an outsourced provider that's supporting us in the administration and they are a for-profit organisation. Um, I see the concerns noted in the paper. I, I don't think I buy them. I think we need to be better. We can't say... Um, external providers can run more efficiently this and then at the same time say that we're running a lean operation with things like enforcements. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowley. I believe Councillor Fitzgerald would like to say something. Uh, again, I, w I wasn't going to and I, I was hoping we could just agree this because it's a positive move, but to uh, Lucinda Robertson's point, uh, I entirely agree, but my understanding about what is included and what is not included, and it's the Secretary of State that has to approve this, that the scheme or areas that are included are evidence-based, and officers say there isn't enough evidence for that. Now, 
That doesn't mean to say that we should ignore those problems, but we have an enforcement team in housing already that can deal with issues of poor housing. It just needs reporting to them. And as for Councillor Ali's points just then, we have learned lessons. That's the point. And what we did before, we didn't do very well because we don't have the expertise or capacity to do that. We didn't. It just didn't work. I'm telling you honestly. And the team, the housing team will tell you. So we are dealing with people that are experts in dealing with this kind of thing at scale. If you want to know the detail about the inspection regime, I'll happily share it offline and Councillor Soresti will. So what we're looking to do is make the service fit for purpose and in fact improve it because all outsourcing is not bad. Because, you know, I, I quoted something yesterday about Peterborough Limited that SIPFA have done a report on, which actually says it is fit for purpose. That's a wholly owned company of the council, but we will be working in partnership with a provider who have a proven track record elsewhere. And I have to tell you, our previous attempt at this was not very good. So that's the lesson learnt in this. And if you want to chat about it, just get under the detail of it with Councillor Cereste and indeed the team, and I hope that will reassure you. But we wouldn't be doing it otherwise. Right, thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. We've got a list of people who want to speak now. We've got Councillor Hogg, Councillor Shaz and the Wires, Councillor Skipstead, Answer Alley, and Councillor Jones. So we'll go to Councillor Hogg first. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, so I have to say, um, I, I disagree uh, with the leader on this. I think. Um, you know, this is an expansion of the scheme. Um, you know, we had the situation with with MPS that was outsourced because we didn't have the um, the, the, the the people in house to be able to deal with with property. Um, and now we've gone out and we've got the people. We've got the right people to do the job, and that's what we should be doing here. Um, you know, again, you know, with with the, you know the kingdom thing, and now we've got the the the, the Whiz Beach security that are doing. Um, patrols in the city, uh, you know, we, we, it seems every time something new comes along, we have to take it outside and, 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 and deal with it using a third party. Well, no, actually, we could go out and we could get the, and bring the, the, the resource to us uh, and employ the right people to do the job um, and, and do it in a way that, you know, as you said, Peterborough Limited is a whole different kettle of fish in the fact that we have far greater control over what they do and how they do things as opposed to a third party where you're stuck into a uh, into a contract that is inflexible and, and causes us problems in the end. Thank you Councillor Hogg. Councillor Strauss-Nawawaz. Thank you Mr Mayor, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor. Two points really, I, I think on 4.3.3 uh, you've got six criteria for when you can legally implement um, selective licensing or a similar scheme. And I think it's important, although outside the scope of this particular uh, conversation, that we focus on improving those six points in terms of crime, deprivation, housing conditions, antisocial behaviour, because where the scheme is implemented right now, in, in mainly in urban areas, uh, Obviously, most of those, those six problems exist, and I think sticking plaster on these huge problems isn't going to fix the overall outcomes. And if we're really committed to improving lives, which I'm, I know we are, uh, then we need to look deeper. Uh, in terms of uh, outsourcing, and I do agree with the Councillor Imtaz Ali and Councillor Hogg, I think, uh, Wayne, uh, Eatwell Limited is not outsourced per se because we've got control over that particular company. I think if we're using arm's length companies to manage such arrangements, I think it works. Generally speaking, in the past, we've spent too much money on outsourcing uh, and the outcome that we've had is, isn't the same as we would have if we had full control and management. So I think we need to look at that very carefully, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wiles. And now move to Councillor Skip's dad. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I was just led to believe that when I saw this and my ward hasn't been identified as one of the areas, that it's not too late. And I was told by the officer that they would consider my area as well now that we're looking at this and it's not too late to do that. So I'm assuming that's correct. Okay, perhaps Councillor Seresti could respond to that when he does his summation. Um, Councillor Ansar Ali. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. 
obviously, like as it has been said before, uh, we have to welcome any effort uh, which improves the quality of uh, housing provided uh, in the private rented sector. Uh, and I think we sh the same should apply in the social rented sector as well. Certainly uh, in my ward, there's a lot of uh, uh, social landlords, and I do come across many instances where uh, the tenants are suffering quite badly, similar type of challenges that have been highlighted. Uh, in terms of uh, outsourcing, uh, uh, I'll certainly be taking up the offer of... Uh, uh, having a chat with uh, with the leader uh, in terms of outsourcing our past experience, I much rather prefer an in-house organisation. I'd uh, uh, I don't want other shareholders to come in and to make a profit uh, uh, from our communities. Basically, I think that we ought to have something in-house. Uh, in terms of uh, previous experience, I'm pleased to hear that the leader said that uh, we have learned from the past. Uh, I, I know you keep hearing Northward a lot because I'm a voice for the, the pe people that I represent. Uh, certainly in the past, uh, the experience uh, of people living and running business in the North Ward hasn't been very good in terms of implementation of this scheme. I hope that we'll, be, we'll do a lot better next time. Thank you, Councillor Ali. I now move to Councillor An Anis um, um, Jones. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, as welcome as this, one of the most difficult things as anybody who's dealing with outsourced contracts is making sure that it does remain cost neutral. And I'd just like some comfort that that actually we're going down the outsource route, but it does remain cost neutral, and that's reported back to the council so that we can keep tabs on it, please. If that could be factored in, that would be very helpful. Thank you, Councillor Jones. That's maybe again something Councillor Sarasti might wish to, to respond to. Um, Councillor Amtradic Bow. Thank you, my central ward. Um, <laughs> I've heard. Um, the council is saying that um, their areas have not been covered in the electoral license scheme. As far as I understand, the Housing Act does give us power to take action if anybody, if any house is not uh, fit outside the scheme. Yeah, so I think you shouldn't be worried. Um, if if you want to report the houses to the council, I think the enforcement team will take out of action because we do have the power within our capacity. I just wanted to highlight that. I think uh, if Councillor Celeste could also mention that in his. Uh, Summing up, I think that will clear, be, give some of clarity. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Iqbal. Is there anyone else who would like to contribute at all? Can't see anybody. Okay, so I'd like to move to Councillor Coles then. Would you like to exercise your right to speak? Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor, the Conservative member for Fletton and Worston speaking here. Um, very grateful for the input from the independent member from North Ward. Very interesting what he had to say. Um, of course, what we're doing here is to implement a process using outsourcing. Now, I've heard the objections, and we, we all know we have reviewed a number of outsourcing contracts, but don't, don't forget, uh, Serco is one of our large companies that we use, which just happens to have brought in this 100% distribution of funds that is... Um, being one of the best administrators of both council tax and, and NDR, and has won a, a national award for being the most improving facility of any council in the country. So I don't accept, just because we're using outsourcing, that that's the dirty word that we must avoid. What we need to have is an effective selective licensing scheme monitored by people who know what they're doing and who can be held accountable. Now, as my position as responsible for procurement, you can bet your bottom dollar and uh, sorry, the council's bottom pound, that I will be absolutely sure that it's monitored and that the performance will be um, held accountable. But I don't think that one should be particularly worried about outsourcing when what we are achieving is to deal with whole areas of our city where there are concerns about the quality of the housing for our residents and the improvements that we can bring about. And that's not to say that there are any particular areas that are, are very bad, but we do know of individual cases that do need to have this level of support, inspection and enforcement. So I do hope, despite your misgivings about outsourcing, that all members will be able to support this. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Coles. And now, Councillor Sarasti, would you like to sum up and respond to the points that mem members have put forward? Uh, thank, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Uh, I mean, 
if we talk about outsourcing, you know, another example would be Millennium, millennium wouldn't it? Our, our, our highways. And let's face it, when I was interviewed on, on uh, um, Radio Cambridge here, uh, and because the other, other uh, authorities had had real problems with, uh, with uh, their potholes, and I quoted to them that we were the, had been voted the best in the whole of the eastern region. Uh, they didn't want to talk to me about it anymore. So it just goes that there are, to show that there are things that do work well. And I also accept that there are things that don't. So we, you know, we have to do the best we can and try to get rid of the rubbish and improve on what we, on what we put in. Um, as far as, um, uh, can, can, uh, you, it's still, uh, one of the councillors wanted to know whether it was too late to make any further suggestions. No, it's not too late, but let me warn you that we need evidence and the bar is very high. Happy to talk to you or happy for you to send us information and we, we, we will deal with it. Um, I, I mean, you are all really good councillors. We may share different political views, but we are all really committed to the people that we elect us and we serve. And we all know what bad housing can do to a family and an individual, and it's devastating. So to be frank, we as a council must do the very best we can to stamp out and get rid of as much of inappropriate housing as we possibly can. Um, we, we, we're doing the best that we can now, but we must improve on that. And I recommend this to council because it, it is crucially important for those people who live in our city and who do not have or do not live in the kind of conditions that all of us would like to. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, again, I haven't heard anybody um, specifically opposing the recommendations. Um, can we take it as being, ag as being agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Right, so um, we now move on to agenda item 10, which is in relation to the record of executive decisions, which are detailed on pages 117 and 100 to 124. I'm going to ask the leader to introduce introduce the item and any questions that are put will be, will, will be answered by the council leader unless he refers them. Um, I would like to remind councillors that they should ask questions that are on the decisions in the reports and that all, all questions should be re relevant to the, to the the, 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 that. Um, if I feel that a, that a preamble is unreasonably long, I will instruct the, the um, councillor to put their question. So can members also to take note of the fact that once we've moved on through the pages, I'm not going to accept any requests to go back to a previous page. So having said that, Councillor Fitzgerald, could I ask you to talk introduce the item. I'm happy to uh, introduce the item as before members tonight, starting on page 117, and I'm sure you'll pick that up from there, Mr. Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm now going to take each page in turn, and when asking their question, could m members please refer to the title or reference number of the decision? So we take page 117, Councillor Imtiaz. Thank you, it's uh, page number 117 and 118. It's actually three items all approved on the 19th of December, all to um, appoint contracts to Milestone Infrastructure Limited, totaling 2.5 million pounds. The question was just, were these contracts put out to tender? Was there a full procurement process? Or did we um, give these contracts to Milestone as a result of existing work that they're doing for us. Thank you. Thank you. Who's going to answer that one? Uh, Councillor Tereste has the responsibility for... Um, Councillor Tereste, thank you. Well, during, during the question, Mr Deputy Mayor, there was a lot of interruption on the microphone. Can you ask the councillor to please repeat the question? OK, yes. If you, if you could just... Um, sure, I'll try that again. Repeat it. Yeah, thank you. On pages 117 and 118, there's three items that were discussed in the Cabinet meeting on the 19th of December, all dealing with approval and allocation of contracts to 
Milestone Infrastructure Limited. They total £2.5 million. My question is, that award of £2.5 million worth of contracts, were they as a result of a, a robust procurement process or were they part of some existing work that Milestone are doing for us and this is almost project creep? Councillor Sarasti. Yeah. Um, uh, they, when, the, when Milestone were given the contract originally, obviously it was part of a very strict process and very strict procurement. However, they are now our preferred contract. So, sorry, Councillor Soresti, um, Councillor Ali saying he can't hear you. Could you speak a bit closer to the microphone? Blimey, that's unusual. And normally I get told I'm too loud. Okay, start again. Um, I, w I would suggest that if you want detail, uh, you write to me and I will get you chapter and verse because each individual contract, I can't, I couldn't possibly tell you the actual detail of each individual contract. I can tell you that Milestone are our preferred contractors. They have a contract with the council and they are allocated contracts as per that arrangement that was made during the procurement process. Thank you, Councillor Seresti. Now move on to Councillor Hogg. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. It's uh, on page 117. Uh, the A16 Norwood Improvement Scheme. Um, I'm, I'm just a, a little bit perplexed in the fact that we have a, a stated aim of reducing um, car travel by 15% uh, by 2030, and yet we seem to be pushing on with these rather large schemes for for extra duelling of of, uh, of our parkway system, and that um, it, it kind of flies in the face of, you know, if it, I can understand if we were looking to, to increase the number of uh, vehicle movements, but we're looking to decrease them. So I'm not sure why we're we're upping the capacity of our road network and spending millions of pounds in the process. Thank you. Is that Councillor Soresti again? I suspect it will be, but okay. just for the sake of Councillor Ali as well, uh, there is a highway services contract which we have with Milestone, so a lot of the work is covered under that contract. Councillor okay. Dresta, do you want to so, pick up this point about Norwood? The uh, the the two major schemes I'm assuming that our councillor is referring to uh, are one for uh, the I think it's called Junction Three, which is in uh, Hampton, and the Norwood Roundabout. If we don't deliver those two schemes, it jeopardises the actual growth in Norwood. And if we don't deliver the Junction 3 scheme, that will that will jeopardise both Haddon and the future development of Hampton. Now, since the whole of our city and economy is predicated on the city growing, growing properly and growing in a way which is in the, for the benefit of the people that live in it, then we've got to make sure they can actually get around the city. Because if they can't get around the city, then our economy goes down, businesses don't work, and we're in serious trouble. But you will see, if you look at the contracts very carefully, you will find that within those bids that we made and the money that we are about to be given is included a lot of reduction in uh, in car travel and walking and travelling and cycling so you know there is a combination in there but we've got to unlock these places otherwise we can't build the houses we need for the people who live in in our city thank you councillor Sarasti. we've got councillor jones next thank you. thank you chair on page 117 passenger transport charges to mileage says here authorise officers to explore and implement the increase in payment per mile from volunteer drivers from 45 to 60 pence per mile. Can you give me a flavour, please, of how long this is going to take, given the fact that uh, it's been 45 pence for a long time and uh, uh, the cost of fuel isn't coming down anytime soon? Thank you. Thank you. Who's going to answer that one? I'm going to take a guess and say Councillor Ayres. Councillor Ayres, OK, Ayers. thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm sorry, but I didn't hear the, the end of the question because people were talking. Could you just repeat the question for me? I'd be please? delighted to. Um, <laughs> volunteer drivers explore and, and implement from 45 pence a mile to 60 pence per mile. Yeah. And given that, you know, fuel charges have been extremely high for a long time, how long is this going to take before those who are doing this benefit from that? 
15 pence per mile increase, please. Um, Councillor Ayer. This, this, is a, this is a figure that was debated by our officers and, and it was discussed with many volunteer drivers that are already doing this work and it was decided that 60p would be an appropriate figure. Um, we, we do need to pay more than 45p because you're absolutely right. The cost of, of running a, a vehicle now, and particularly with the petrol, albeit that is now coming down from where it used to be, um, it, they do need to be paid properly where this is concerned. And this is going to help us to save m money and also to have a better time for the children to get to, to, get to school. And it, we, we went through this at, the, at one of our meetings very recently, Councillor Jones, as you probably re remember. Did you indicate you want to ask a fo follow-up question on that? Yeah, thing? thank okay. you, Councillor Ayres. Is, we're not disagreeing about the, the uplift. I'm talking about it actually says to explore and implement. How long is it going to take you to explore before it's actually <laughs> implemented, given that people are already paying the increased charges, albeit diesel and petrol prices are coming down marginally. Thank you. It has to go through the proper procedures, Councillor Jones. And of course, this is, this is a very recent report on how to deal with this, the home school transport, which you have, you have heard about, of course. I can't give you an exact time how long it will take to implement, but it will be as soon as possible. Okay, um, Councillor Soresti, is it, sorry, Councillor Fitzgerald, is it responding to the it, same it, question? It, it, okay, it helps okay, Councillor yeah. Jones and other members. I think Councillor Ayres is right. She, sorry, Councillor Jones, she didn't hear you, the second part of the question. So I, I, I get it. You want to know if it's been implemented and if not, when. So I think uh, a, a, an action for Dan or somebody from Democratic Services is to come back to you and members of the Council when it's been discussed with officers, as Councillor Ayres says, it's quite a recent report, what the likely time scales are, because we may not know that today because there might be another meeting to discuss its implementation. But we'll come back. Is that OK? Yeah, that, that, that's okay, fine. Thank you. It, it hinges no, sorry, you, you can't, you've, you've actually had two it's questions. It's the word explore that I'm concerned about. OK, thank you. So that would be helpful. Councillor John Fox. Oh, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. I just want to ask a quick question of the A16 Norwood Improvement Scheme. I mean, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Councillor Soresti, that there's going to be a footbridge across that A16. And I don't know what the cost of that would be, but I imagine it's quite phenomenal. When there's a cheaper alternative, I believe, well, I'm not a construction engineer, but I believe there's a che cheaper alternative. And I just wondered if you've considered the car dike uh, scheme, where that could easily be turned into a cycling footpath, which probably would be a lot less cost. Uh, are you aware of that, or have you been told about that, or not, please? Sorry. Yes. Um, so we we, now, we so we that that was all on the first page, one hundred and seventeen. So if we now move to page one hundred and eight. So we sorry, Councillor Savard, we we were just deciding between us. Sorry, and you jumped. You, you need to answer the question. I, sorry, I, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, sorry, Councillor Fox. I, I think Councillor Soresti will undertake to discuss the matter in detail with Highways and Transport. If you let him have an email just outlining what your thoughts are, then Marco will be able to discuss it with Charlotte and the team and come back to you. Okay? okay. Um, Councillor Fox, did you want to ask another question? Yeah, I, I did outline them to the, uh, the, the Mayor's uh, Transport Manager. I can't think of his name. So they are aware, but I wondered if you're aware. If you're not, I'll make you aware because I think it could be cheaper uh, and save a fair bit of money. Okay. Anybody wants to respond to that? Or? I, I think we did. I, th okay, I think right. if Councillor Fox speaks to Marco yeah. directly, and okay. maybe they can have a discussion uh, to make sure that everybody's aware of what Councillor Fox knows. That's fair yeah. enough. Okay. So we now move on to page 118, Councillor Hogg. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, so just a, a quick question uh, on the um, application for uh, moving traffic enforcement powers. Uh, can I have assurances that this will mean that PES officers will be able to step outside uh, of our city centre and do some valuable work in our neighbourhoods? Thank you, Councillor Hogg. Who's going to reply to the, that one then? Sir? Um, 
Uh, well, well uh, yes, I suppose it's a simple answer that it will free up time. I'm not, I was just trying to work out whether they're PES officers that do that. Well, currently we don't have anybody that does it because we're not allowed to do it. So it will become an automated system that relies on technology, which is something that the police should be doing, but currently don't do because of their resources. So we will benefit from being able to enforce those powers electronically. PES officers, um, uh, well, there's lots of different types, but the people involved in enforcement, particularly of traffic and other offences, will obviously be freer, but they're not doing it now, if you see what I mean. But uh, So it doesn't free them up at all from something they're not doing. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nicola Day, you've got a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, Mines on rural disposals, which starts on page 118, but then hangs over into 119, so I hope I'm in the right place. Um, but it's about the proposed marketing for the disposal of the vacant Turves farm, which uh, Cabinet has considered and resolved to um, dispose of it. I just wondered if we could be thinking a bit more carefully about what we're doing with our farms in terms of, could we be thinking a bit more creatively uh, in terms of, could, could we, for example, plant a woodland on a farm which would bring uh, net zero carbon benefits? Or at the moment, I, we're looking at budget ideas of building a two million pound eco homes project. Could we build that on, on such land? Or could we look at a solar panel uh, uh project for renewable energy. I just wondered if there's other things that we're thinking about uh, that we could potentially give us a lot more value back in the future than actually disposing of farmland. Just just some thoughts. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Cos will give some details, but all of those things, and I just uttered the words solar panels, and you, it was like a mirror. Councillor Chereste can give you chapter and verse on that, folks, for those that have been here long enough about solar panels on farms. Uh, <laughs> but good luck with that. Uh, Andy Coles. Uh, thank you very much for the for the question, uh, Councillor Day. The, the relevant uh, point about this particular sale is that we need to gain the capital receipts for the council's budget. So this is a particular need that we are fulfilling right now, but you're quite right to suggest we might be able to do other things with other land that we own and might be able to generate um, more um, income for the city. But specifically about this, this, this item, it was purely that we needed the capital receipts for the budget. Thank, you, Thank you. And I'm sorry I wasn't around with the solar panels for Marcus Thursday. I would have liked to have been around then. We're happy that you take it forward. Thank you. Right. So any more on 118? No. So we'll go to 119 then. Anything on 119? So we go to 120. Councillor Hogg. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. So it's the question uh, around the Towns Fund business case for the Vine. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed that, that we're essentially looking to, to, to move the library from one end of the town to the other at a time where we have a swimming pool uh, that is in dire need of replacement. It seems to me that that's where the, um, the priority should be laid. And uh, do you have a, a reason for why it is being put to one side? Yeah, you're just going to go for that one. Councillor Steve Allen, it's in his portfolio. Councillor Allen, I believe. Thanks for the uh, question, Councillor Hogg. Uh, the Vine case is predicated on uh, uh, monies coming in from the Towns Fund, as you know. Um, uh, at the moment, there are plans A, B, and C waiting for approval. And uh, I think plan C means that the library stays where it is. Plan A means it moves to the uh, uh, TK Maxx building, we'll call it. And Plan B is a hybrid. So the situation is it's not a done deal yet. Thank you. OK, um, anybody else on 120? No, OK, so... Uh, uh, Council. Sorry, Mr Deputy, I've got, uh, I've got another one on page 120, uh, which is about the transfer of the regional pool. And it, this has been partially answered tonight, but I do want to have an assurance that the disabled parking that will be lost uh, by the closure of the, um, the regional pool car park will be in place at the, uh, the site of uh, the, the, the town pool, or the regional pool, should I say, um, before the closure of the, the, you know, we're not going to have to wait a few months before that's caught up and that people uh, with disabled parking um, will not have to wait a number of months while the council gets their ducks in order. So could I have an assurance that, that that won't be the case? 
Okay, who's going to answer that one? Uh, well, it's very simple. I think the insurance has already been given. My, my understanding is that there's already some disabled places right on site. I think Councillor Cereste gave an undertaking earlier that actually we're trying to improve it, but at the same time not waste money because I'll state it clear here and now for everybody, the plan is to knock the pool down and build another one. And that's a project that we're working on and we have a number of sites identified. And the sooner we can do that, folks, the better, because the old one's costing us a lot of money that we can't afford. So we need to move on that. So I hope everybody's on board with that. And we are working on it as a priority, uh, particularly now that we've got the new property chap in and everything else. So, but from a parking point of view, rest assured, reassurance again, it's all fine. And officers have assured me that everything will be tickety-boo and nobody will be inconvenienced in the short term. Thank you, Councillor Fitzgerald. So anything else on uh, 120, Councillor Harkins? I just want the clarification that the, the part, there will not be a, a, a gap between the closure of the regional pool car park and the the extra provision of uh, to replace Correct. the number of disabled spots. Correct. That's right. That's all there I wanted is, to hear. Because th there's as, parking as, on as site. Can, can, can we have can we have a question and then and so, then a response so the, to the that question? Was the, to the question was I wanted that assurance because the, the answer he gave was was kind of uh, gave a bit of room for manoeuvre. Shall Mar we say? Mar Marco has a definitive. Um, Councillor Sarasti, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. But just a point of clarity: we're not closing the regional pool car park. I mean, the councillor seems to think we're closing the pool. We're not. We're going no, to not improve the it. The car park is being Sorry, closed. Councillor Hart, can you, you've asked the question. Can you let, let him answer? I think. Okay. Carry on, Councillor Seresti. I said what I was going to say, Mr. Deputy Mayor. We're, we're doing Can some, we're doing some work a point to it. That you to, is it a point and of order point, or a point of explanation? Point of explanation. Okay. At no point did I say anything about the regional pool closing. What I am talking about is the regional pool car park. It will be closed in order for phase three of the university development to go forward. And what I am asking for is when that happens, will the replacement disabled parking spaces be available to people that had used those in the car park? I'm not closed. convinced that is a point of a personal explanation, but Councillor for the fourth Sir, time, Councillor yes. Seresti, if you could respond to it. Um, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor, the, the whole plan is to build a temporary car park to facilitate everything that is needed so that if and when the actual car park at the regional pool has to close, nobody is going to be discomforted. Thank you, Councillor Sosresti. So if there's nothing more on 120, if we can move to page 121. And then we move on to the decisions of individual cabinet members starting on page 122, then page 123. Councillor um, Shabina, um, is, it, is it 122 or 123? 123, Mr Deputy. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. I'd just like to ask um, in reference to the uplifting payments for delivery of public health services and primary care. This was something that was actually discussed at our most recent adult and health scrutiny committee meeting. Um, and the uplifting price paid for each unit delivered in the following services, such as stop smoking, NHS health checks and long acting reversible contraception. It was substantiated within the adult and health scrutiny committee meeting that the uplift is going to be from double digits to £125 per patient in primary care, who undergo smoking cessation. Now, I've gone away and done a little bit of research on this, and I've seen in the document of 2020, under the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, the core data report, that Peterborough has statistically significantly higher rates of smoking quitters than the national rate. So having a look at these encouraging figures, my question to the Cabinet member is that was a consultation, um, did a consultation take place with stakeholders of primary care, how have we substantiated that we need, can justify this uplift? And also, are we not looking at the pressures on primary care at this moment in time? Uh, because the flavour that I get is it's really not a priority when you look at other things like accessibility. So are we going to be adding to that burden? Um, and why can that funding not be put into 
other issues that come under the public health remit, such as drug addiction services okay, and alcohol uh, yeah. and mental health. Thank you. Uh, okay, I, th I, th I think we've got the question. Um, who's going to respond? Is it Councillor Howard? It is indeed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zepp. Councillor Howard. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm glad I've got a question because I've got a whole raft of decisions on this paper. So thank you, Councillor Kyle. Um, it sounds like there's a few a few questions within this. I think um, one of the answers is I think there's a there's a common interest in in reducing smoking, and there is also sympathies with GP practices for the pressure they're already under. Um, but I think there's a common goal between everyone that the less the less people smoking, the better it is for GPs and for public health as well. Um, going back to the consultation and the figures, if you want to drop me an email, I'm more than happy to discuss that with you in, in more detail to give you some more info on that. Thank you. Could I come back to Thank that, you. Um, Yeah, could you make your question specifically relating to the item? Because I, I think your previous question was not quite on target, so maybe, carry on. I respectfully disagree, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It was specifically about smoking cessation services and an alternative to that. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that I think that it should be reflected upon that whilst it's a common interest, but the evidence behind it in the recent JSNA report, which comes under the remit of this council, shows that we have a higher proportion of smoking quitters in Peterborough than the national average. So I'd just like to make that point. Thank you. Okay, that was a point rather than a question. Would you like to respond to it as well? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, this could have been raised at scrutiny because we had a, a really big conversation on this topic. Um, but again, I'd say, you know, if there's anything further to say, please, you know, drop me an email, give me a call. Happy to discuss it with you. Um, you know, our director of public health really supports these measures. So, you know, happy to carry on the conversation. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Um, so if there's nothing else on 122, we move to 123. Anything on that one? Page 124, Councillor Hogg. Just a quick question um, regarding the um, NPS Peterborough Limited uh, appointments. Uh, was this just to help facilitate the bringing in a, a house um, for, of the NPS because that's, uh, I believe it's the 1st of February that it comes in house. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, what was the point of doing this when, you know, actually it was coming to an end anyway? Was it to help facilitate that, that um, breaking up of, of the, uh, the agreement? Thank you. Who's going to respond to that one? Me. Councillor Fitzgerald. Continuous representation until the thing is ended. So the council needs to be represented on NPS because it is a partnership with them rather than just abandonment and it will wind itself down naturally. The service transfers and we will still need the legals and all the other things to sort out. And I believe from memory it's Adrian Chapman. Thank you. Okay, um, that, that concludes the um, questions. I think we've had quite a large number of questions but there's been some really interesting ones so that's really good. Um, if we can now move to agenda item 11, which is in relation to the record of combined authority decisions, which are listed in the additional information pack. I will refer any questions to the relevant combined authority representative. Um, I'm going to take each of the appendices in, t in turn and... Um, and sort of ask if any members have any questions. So if we go to Appendix 1, which is the record of the Audit and Governance Committee of the Combined Authority, which took place on September 30th. Are there any questions on that? No, okay. Appendix 2 is the record of the Audit and Governance Committee of the Combined Authority held on the 2nd of December. Has anybody got any questions on that? No. Okay. Appendix three is the Combined Authority Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which took place on the 17th of October. Any questions on that? No. Appendix four, the, over the meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which took place on November the 28th. Any questions on that? No. Appendix 5, um, the, the meeting of the board of the combined authority, which took place on the 19th of October. Has anybody got any questions on that? No. Okay, appendix number 6, the meeting of the, of the board of the combined authority, which took place on November the 30th. 
Any questions on that? No. Okay, so that's very quick then. Okay, so we now move to agenda item 12, which is mm, the motions that have been put forward by councillors. And the first motion is from Councillor Burbage. So if, if you would like to propose your mm, motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I'd like to uh, put forward this motion and reserve my right to speak later. Uh, you, well, you've, you, you've actually got a right to some eight on it, but you yeah, do I'll, not I'll, want to I'll sum up introduce in the end, it. That's fine. Okay, okay. That's a bit unusual, but okay. you you are supposed to well, make okay, your speech no, as you okay. introduce it. So um, I'll, I'll I'll tell you now where I'm at. Um, so a couple of years ago, I put a motion to full council um, regarding autism and uh, planning for a future strategy. For Peterborough, which was uh, gratefully passed by everybody. Um, since then, we've had request, I've had requests from councils around the country, councillors around the country, and I'm pleased to say that uh, a couple of other councils around the country have also now put similar motions forward. Um, little did I know at the time that a father and son were working on the excellent autism boards that we've seen popping up around Peterborough now. Um, we've got one in Breton, which our Breton councillors have put forward. There's others in Longthorpe, uh, Fletton and Stanground, Iron Thorny. Um, so, as with the, autism, uh, the autism strategy that was passed, uh, I believe these boards help and link in with that, um, helping Peter to become uh, more autism aware, and especially from uh, a young age. Um, they're not only just beneficial for children who live with autism, but also for all uh, non-verbal non communicating children, as well as those that don't use English as a first language necessarily. Um, so with your, with your blessing, I'd like to go ahead and try and see if we can get these into all schools around Peterborough um, with, the, with the hope of spreading that around. Thank you, Councillor Burbage, for proposing that motion. Councillor Ray, will you, would you like to second the motion and either speak now or reserve your right to speak? Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. I'm happy to second this motion from Councillor Burbage. It highlights a brilliant initiative that I've been lucky to already see the benefits from in my own ward. As well as Breton and Fletton and Stanground, as Councillor Burbage said, we're fortunate to have one of these boards in each of I, Thorny and Newborough, thanks to the CLF fund contributed by my colleagues Councillor Simons and Councillor Allen, as well as my predecessor Councillor Richard Brown. There has been a lot of great feedback from residents whose children have benefited from these, not only those on the autism spectrum, but as previously mentioned, those whose mother tongue may be different from other children in the playground, or those who simply just don't know how to say what they want to say on that particular occasion, which I'm sure many of us can probably relate to as well, even at our ages. This is an excellent suggestion, and I hope the up uptake from education providers is strong across the city, and that we can count on support from across the city's wards and across the political groups that are here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to, can I call upon anyone else who would like to speak? Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, it's, been, it's been pointed out to me that we normally have a break about halfway through the four-hour period, so we're just coming up to two hours. So would members be agreeable to taking a break at this point? Okay. okay. I take that that we will have a break. Um, I think we normally... No. Is it... A Okay, I will rule that we that we will take a break at this point. Thank you.
Sports England. So there's no need for it not to continue if we get the finances come in from wherever. So I'd like some sort of reassurance that when it happens, with the regional pool being replaced, that Warrington will not be left out because the Warrington residents deserve this because they've waited far, far too long. Thank you, Councillor Fox, for being so concise. Um, Councillor Harper, I understand you wish to second the motion. Um, would you say whether you'd like to speak now or reserve your right to speak? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor, and uh, I'll speak now. There's not much more to say. Uh, yes, I second it, um, this uh, motion. The north of the city needs a public swimming pool. It's been a long, long time overdue. A lot of work has been done previously, as uh, uh, Councillor Fox has already alluded to. Um, and when, when you go to go out to big consultation, you speak to big uh, groups like Sport England, who fully support the idea, I think... Uh, it's the right thing to do, and I fully support uh, Councillor Fox's uh, motion, and I hope this council can include it in its future plans to make sure a pool happens, public pool happens on the north of this city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Any further speakers? Councillor Al. The last few years of more water in the city rather than a big lump of water in the middle of the city, i.e. we want pools in various areas of the city and particularly the north, which is undersupplied with swimming pool facilities. Um, just to show you how interested in this project I am, here are the notes that I was supplied in 2018. Um, it's now down to why haven't we got it? COVID obviously got in the way. Funding issues are also very relevant. Uh, so I am going to support this motion in principle that we need water in the north of the city. And that will embrace supply to Paston, Warrington, um, to uh, Ithorny, Newborough Ward um, and Gunthorpe. So uh, let's try to get uh, behind this project, but we need the funding. And I think that my colleague, uh, Councillor Coles, will have a view on that. But in principle, supporting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. And I've got Councillor Coles, Councillor Ansar Ali and Councillor Hogg. So we'll take Councillor Coles first. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. And I suppose on this very important night for those of Scottish ancestry of Burns Night, I have just a uh, quote from the Bard himself, the best laid schemes are my cement gang after glee. It's absolutely true. I would love to have had my pleasure um, fair meadows pool in Woodston, just as much as you would like to have the, the pool in Warrington. Um, the issues we have is, is very clear is, is that COVID has really banjaxed everything and we've had to work on the budget and it's unfortunate there isn't a level of finance available to build one or both at the moment. So we have to concentrate together to make sure we can find this money, get the grants and then provide this. So very much in support, but I'd I just have to be realistic about this, that we have really been affected quite badly by COVID and by the current um, increasing costs and in our, our financial situation. But I'm very hopeful at, at the, the particular time when we can get the grants to provide all of this, that we can put the Warrington scheme back on the table. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Coles. And Sir Ali, next, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Uh, I'm fully supportive of uh, the motion that... Uh, Councillor John Fox has uh, put forward. I think it's very important uh, that we provide uh, facilities uh, for all our citizens across the city, which are accessible and affordable. Uh, also, I want to draw attention uh, of members to an email that we received uh, from Simon Martin, who's City of Peterborough Swimming Club uh, co-chair. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all of us have received that email. I think uh, I would encourage uh, the leader of the council and councillor Alan as well uh, to keep them in the loop as well, just to make sure that uh, we're meeting the needs uh, of those people who are aspiring to be uh, uh, international swimmers as well from our city. Thank you, Councillor Valley. Councillor Hogg, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, so I have a confession to make. Um, I came into um, this chamber uh, thinking that I was going to be voting against this. Um, however, um, I, I, you know, as as we, we're always told on planning to keep an open mind, um, and uh, you know, with 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 that in mind, I I was under the misinterpretation that this meant 
that Warrington would get the replacement for the regional pool. And that I, I now uh, agree that, that that is not the case. And so therefore, my, my main issue with that has now fallen away. And I think it is right and proper that Warrington does have a pool uh, in the same way that Stanground has a pool. Uh, there's, there's one in, uh, in Ravens, uh, Ravensthorpe. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have pools dotted around the city. Um, and especially with the, with the closing of the deeping pool, uh, it seems that, you know, that, that, that there's even more demand that could be, um, used, uh, to, to, uh, to make this pool a very, uh, a success. So, um, as a group, we, we have an open vote on this. There's, there's no kind of whipping involved. Um, and I would call upon my colleagues, colleagues to, um, roundly support this, uh, motion from, uh, Councillor Fox. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hock, Councillor Jim Meal. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, as the Ward Councillor for Central Ward, I'd like to keep the regional pool where it is, um, within my ward. However, I have great sympathy for Councillor Fox. I do think that that part of the city deserves and, and should have a swimming pool. We had a perfectly good swimming pool at Breton when Breton Woods closed. However, we chose to close that as well. We would have had a, a, another one. And as Councillor Coles pulled out, these are quite expensive when you have to build them and then to, to maintain them. So tonight, we are going to support Councillor uh, Fox's motion tonight. Um, however, I would also like to keep the one in the city centre as well, because I think with the university, it would be good cool to keep everything all together. And I think we have support from Simon Martin, um, who runs a swimming club from there. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jamil. Councillor Wayne Fitzgerald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I wasn't going to comment. I think um, uh, our nominated speakers tonight have both spoken and, and made the intentions of our group clear. We have no whip on this, but I think, uh, generally speaking, I could, we very, I couldn't even think of an occasion where we do really. Uh, we, we, we're broadly in support. Uh, but I've been drawn into the debate because Councillor Ali named me and unfortunately other people then will want to know. So I'll be perfectly clear. And I think for Councillor Jamil, the intention is actually to keep it more or less where it is very close by so it may well remain certainly central to the city so to be clear and i told both councillors john fox and judy fox six months ago that i would give a commitment to them to help try and facilitate the new pool that hasn't changed my colleagues have articulated what got in the way uh the 37 million on pleasure fair meadow was just unaffordable and i'm sorry about that council calls um but uh, it, it's not been helped with covid and indeed our finances however we are desperately trying to solve the regional pool situation uh, given that it also has some implications for school swimming uh, we want to maintain that, so that's one dilemma, and also improve a state-of-the-art facility in gyms, uh, facilities, and so on. But it, we agree, so the Warrington thing is very much still on, on, on the table, and we'll try and bring that forward as quickly as we can, but we have the same problems of, of financing, and I'll be working with Cecilia. But I have to say, we will be looking to the private sector, and if I gave you a good example of good private sector partnership it would be vivacity premier in hampton which not only brought a great return to the council what was was and is a great facility so all of those options are being explored and, and i've only got involved because in terms of the swimming club we are aware of how important swimming is to them and many others in the city uh, both at an early age as well it's vital that we teach kids to swim so that commitment remains about swimming uh, and about improving leisure services and that's part of a wider conversation about leisure in general that Adrian Chapman is leading the work on so I hope that gives some reassurance to members it's pretty much high on the agenda and and it's costing us money if we don't do something about it. Thank you Councillor Fitzgerald I mean very impressed to see everybody's keeping within the three minutes that's really commendable. That was purely <laughs> fluke. <laughs> Thank you. Are there, is, is there anybody else who would like to contribute to this discussion? I detect there's a measure of cross-party support so can we take that as agreed then? Thank you. Okay. So we, we now move um, to the, the to motion number three from Councillor John Fox. Would you, would you like to propose that please? 
Yes, I most certainly would, and thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. This is not a new motion. This is something that Councillor Tyler will know. We campaigned for several years to get the back of the town hall to disabled friendly, disabled bays completely. We went to see the leader of the council then, which was Councillor Soresti, who was always pre prepared to listen. And he, he came up with an agreement that we would have half of it as blue badge disabled parking and we'll see how much of a success it was. And we give it a time, we give it a period of time and it was successful. By that time, he was no longer the leader, Councillor Holditch was, but he was a cabinet member and was given the task to go away and find more blue bay badge parking within the city centre because people with limited mobility and disabilities who want to get to the banks, and most of our banks are in Cathedral Square, we know that. They want to get near. They want to get as near as they can. And also the cafes, the restaurants, the events that are going on in the market, the events that are going on in the Cathedral Square, they want to be near. Now, as you all know, the government's guidelines is 6% of all our parking should be disabled friendly for people with limited mobility. They, the cabinet or the administration got an outside body in to investigate it, how we could get up to 6%. Some of the councillor Tyler knows we really wanted to see in this city. It went to the cabinet on the 11th of July, 2022, and a parking strategy was uh, discussed and I don't know the outcome fully, but I think it was agreed and they were going to get up to, I think it's 5.88%, which isn't too bad. It's not over 6%, but it's close to 6%. But if you see where they're actually going to put the bays to bring it up to that, that Bishop's Row, Brook Street, Carhaven, Pleasure Fair, Meadow, Railway Settings, Regional Pool, Riverside, San Martin House, Trinity Street, Wellington Street and London Road. People with disabilities are not going to walk from a lot of these places. So you're not really, and I, I would ask the question, who did you consult with? Did you consult with the disability forum? Did you just consult with disability groups? Because they're the experts. They are the experts. The people with disabilities are the experts. They're the ones that need to be consulted. Because I didn't know even this was going to, maybe I missed it, going to cabinet. Um, I want to see more base and I hope you will support it because it is important. Because whether you know this or not, the came up that we as Peterborough have 18.3% population that have disabilities. 31.6% of householders have at least one family member living with in that household with a disability. That's a lot of people. We should be fully supporting them to get them accessible in this city. We want to make this city accessible for all. To do that, you need to consult with the people that matter. And the people with disabilities and the blue badge holders are the ones that matter. You need to consult with them. So I'd rather you really think hard about this because they cannot be ignored. They cannot be ignored. People find it difficult to come into this city because they have nowhere to park. Outside there, if you go there at 12, between 12 and 1 every day, every single blue badge bay is full. So it proves we need that extension. It's no good putting it somewhere out of the city centre. It needs to be behind the town hall. And I, I, I When accompanying blue badge holders who wish to shop here, I'm concerned that the Council's Disabilities and Older People's Advisor withdrew support for the motion and I understand concerns about loss of revenue were at least part of the reason. Inclusion is a challenge, but it's a challenge that local authorities are expected to rise to and the equalities legislation that's been in place for some time does require that reasonable adjustments are made to ensure that disabled people are included in society. I note that some electric vehicle charging bays have been added to St Peter's Road and that's fine, but that sense that disabled people are further down the pecking order is troubling. We should be concerned by Councillor Fox's observation that the blue badge spaces aren't used after 6pm. 6 uh, 6 Peterborough has a thriving nighttime economy of which disabled residents should be a part. Disabled residents and visitors are not under curfew, although it's starting to feel like it. 
It's Holocaust Memorial Day this week, and we also remember the many millions of disabled people murdered in genocides because their lives were deemed of less value, life unworthy of life. We have to be alert to where this all starts, and it starts when society decides it's okay to treat its disabled people a little bit worse than everyone else. In a fair society, disabled people, those with visible and invisible impairments, must be seen. We must be consulted, we must be heard, we must be included. I do ask you to support this motion, but whether you can or whether you can't, I would ask everyone here to please dwell on what we've said and what it means for our city. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Hogg, I understand you wish to move a procedural motion under Standing Order 20.1 to refer the motion to an appropriate body. If so, would you please do so? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, <coughs> Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, essentially, um, I, I think that you know that, that there's some there's some really good um, things to be had from this. Uh, but I, what I am worried about is that um, that maybe the, there isn't the data that that one can have uh, to make a proper and, and informed uh, decision. Uh, specifically, I think that we also need to look at other areas uh, and not just the area. Uh, that, that is included in this in motion that such such as uh, the end of Priestgate, for instance, there's at least sort of seven bays that could be used for disabled parking, which is not available at the moment because it's double yellow lined with with hatch markings. So um, what I would like to see is it going to scrutiny committee um, with a report from officers to, to look at this. Um, you know, with a, with a fine, finer tooth comb, uh, but also just take it, you know, let's have a, a second look at this. Let's have a look at it in, in the cold light of day. Let's have a report done uh, and let's involve community groups to get the right solution and not just a solution. Thank you, Councillor Hogg. So just to be, be, be clarify, you, you wanting to refer it to the growth and um, communities scrutiny committee okay so um the process that we now have is that we have a debate on the procedural motion um if the procedural motion is is carried then it then gets referred to the scrutiny committee if the procedural motion is defeated um it, we will then continue and have a debate on the substantive m motion so, Councillor Chris Wiggin, um, would you like to second the procedural motion? Sorry, Councillor Councillor Hogg. What? Just, just for clarification, so this is different different to an amendment because with amendment we we debate at the same time. It's it's not. It's it, this is a, a different mechanism. Okay, I just thought, thought I'll, I'd get that. I will ask the legal officer to clarify that. No, okay, yeah. Um, this, the, the, the constitution requires that we discuss the procedural motion first. Whereas, whereas we have a procedure with an amendment that we discuss them all at the same time. So, um, right. So, Councillor Chris w w Wiggin, will you, would you like to s s second the procedural m motion and I, either speak now or, or reserve your right to s s speak? Uh, thank you, Councillor Harper. Yes, um, I totally understand where Councillor Hogg is coming from, but this has been done. This is this is in danger of kicking the can further down the road, in my view. I think uh, Councillor Fox and uh, has done these discussions with, with and Councillor Tyler, to be fair, um, have done the consultation effectively, and that's why the motion's here because they know what the you know the disabled people are saying. So I think to push it again to an already very busy um, consultation with it within scrutiny and maybe another task and finish group. I just think we're in danger of just pushing this on and on and on. I think it's reached the head where I think there have been some good speeches. I think it should be make the decision. That, that's my view. Thank you. Right. Councillor Marco Sarubapasti. Uh, Mr Deputy Mayor, in a, in, a, in a way to try and be helpful, uh, this motion is something, or we've been discussing within the group and with the leader, something very similar. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I would like to offer Councillor Fox the opportunity to meet with me and anyone else he likes uh, to look at what can be done, because I happen to agree. Yeah, but I'd like to agree with Councillor Hogg 
that actually we can't stick them all behind us, but we need to spread them around the city centre to make it even more convenient. Who uh, to make it more convenient for those who need them? Okay, um, that's something that members may wish to bear in mind. But we have a procedural motion on on the table to refer it to the scrutiny committee. So, are there any other speakers on that? In which case, I'll ask Councillor Chris Wigan to um, second. Uh, nothing further to add. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy. Okay, so in that case, I'll ask Councillor Hogg if he wishes to some mate on the procedural. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, I think I've said my piece. I, you know, I think people's from the from the feeling of the room, reading the room. I think people have already made their mind up as to which way they're going to be voting. So anything I say will just be um, uh, hot air and and not really much uh, else. So um, if we go to the vote, that would be good. Okay, um, Councillor Fox, you were, were uh, did, did, did you want to say something? Or am, I, am I allowed to speak on this? Um, you you would have been allowed to speak, but you you would have needed to put your hand up because, um, yeah. And um, sorry, can I just can I just get legal advice on this? Okay, um, we, we may not have seen you when you put your hand up, so on the, this occasion, we will allow you to speak. I, I think it, I just want a, a, a result from this, uh, so people can come to the city centre, find a place to park, and visit our city centre, the more the merrier, but they shouldn't be fighting over a food base. When we looked at Councillor Soresti looked at putting in Priestgate and everywhere. He, he's been there, he's done that, and, it, and there's no more increase of bays in that area. Tell me whether there's any land we can do. We've got the station quarter coming up. We've got this lot of money that's going to be put on the station quarter. We should be looking at things like more parking bays there, especially with the railway, because if you go down the railway, Councillor Tyler would tell you there's not many there. So, But I'm happy to meet with Councillor Soresti, with other people, to discuss this fully and with disabled groups who, you know, as well and have their input. We know we have their input because me and Councillor Tyler worked for years talking when he was the manager of the Disability Forum. So we know what they want and, and we know that's a successful scheme. So I, I don't think it needs to go to scrutiny, but I will say that I, I totally agree with me with Councillor Soresti to thrash this out and then come back and say, what we feel right the we we can only debate the motion that's on the table so um we i i, th I think the the procedural motion isn't agreed so we'll sorry councillor hogg what, what so i i'm i'm kind of reading the oh, is, is it a point of order a point it's of to do with the, it's to do with the with the motion here so so it, no is it a point of order a point of personal explanation or a point of accuracy well, it, 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 it's it, it it's leading to me basically withdrawing my motion okay on the basis that i think that what we're saying here is that it may not be in 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 exactly the, the right guys for the room to be saying yes um what i my motion was attempting to do was have a conversation so that we can get the right result for peterborough uh councillor fox has now said that he basically will be happy to um talk to councillor soresti to get a deal done um it seems to me that to, in order to do that he would need to withdraw his motion uh to maybe then um bring it back another time if he's unsatisfied uh, find an hey, unsatisfactory so result can't have, we can't have a further debate so Time are you debate. are you withdrawing your I am procedural withdrawing motion? My, my so, motion my motion yes so the procedural motion is withdrawn you need to take legal advice sorry. Okay, I'm making a ruling that the procedural motion has been withdrawn. So now we proceed to the debate on the on the motion. Is that is there anyone else who would like to speak, Councillor Nicola Day? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, we're really supportive of this motion to in increase more disabled parking bays in the city centre. Um, uh, we certainly know that we need to make the city centre more accessible to those with disabilities. 
One thing we wondered, though, um, is we wondered whether they could be jeweled in use. I'm not sure if that's a, a, a possibility because I'm certainly aware, and I do this myself, and so do many of my female colleagues, that people park on St Peter's Road, particularly women that don't want to walk through the car haven at night. I've had a couple of incidences myself in the car haven um, because it's such a short distance, and um, not just for myself, but I would imagine other women that have to come into the city centre on their own at night. So I just wondered if that's something we could explore. Okay, thank you. Hey, I've got Councillor Fitch Jowell wishes to speak. Uh, thank you, Miss, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And again, I, I, I will address my remarks to Councillor Fox to be helpful. The group have discussed it and Marco had volunteered to speak to Councillor Fox and anybody else to try and find some compromises and improve the situation. It would be helpful if Councillor Fox withdrew the motion as is because we can't support it as is and I know a number of other people in the chamber feel the same. So I think if some dialogue uh, with Councillor Fox was enabled to happen with Councillor Tresty that he could then deliver to the group with Councillor Tyler's involvement and other people have an interest in the disability issues in the city that might be more beneficial and perhaps it can come back when it could be something uh, uh, as one on a future occasion. I hope that satisfies Councillor Fox in the chamber and we can move on. Okay, so Councillor Fox, would you like to withdraw the motion? Well, can I speak before I say yes? Yes, you can. <laughs> Uh, yes, I mean, the most important thing is to look at it uh, with the people who know. Councillor Tyler, the Disability Forum as well. Uh, I'm going to become a member of the Disability Forum. I haven't, I'm not yet. Hopefully I'm going to be a member. Uh, they've invited me along, so we'll see. Um, but what we mustn't forget is wheelchair accessible vehicles. And for those of you who don't know what they are, they are the larger transit vans where wheelchairs come out the back well, if St. Peter's Arcade was the only place they could park, they would have to come out into the road where the flow of the traffic is, which is highly dangerous. There is an area, which we, Councillor Tyler will tell you, we looked at several years ago, at the back of the town hall, which could be converted into two large vehicles, uh, large spaces for wheel accessible vehicles. And they are also vehicles that come from homes where people bring wheel, people in wheelchairs and several people get out, but they don't want to be coming out into the road. They want to be able to come out and get on a footpath. So we, we need to consider that. But we can talk this with Councillor Tyler, with the people that, you know, want to get involved and with Councillor Soresti. And then we can come to a decision. So I will withdraw my motion on that understanding, on that understanding. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you, the, there is a procedure in the Constitution, um, Standing Order 21.9, which says that a member may withdraw a motion which he has moved with the consent of both the meeting and the su seconder. So can I ask the seconder, Councillor St Stevenson, are you, are you giving your consent for Councillor for Fox to withdraw his motion? I'm giving my consent. Okay. And can I ha and can I ask the m m meeting? Agreed. Would you? That's that's agreed. So if if that's agreed, I declare that the motion has been withdrawn. Thank you. Okay, so um, after that complicated discussion, we now move to agenda item thirteen A, which is in relation to a to a, to a revised political proportionality. Further information on this is provided in the additional information pack. Councillor Nicola Day, can I ask you to, to put the recommendations forward? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be really brief. Um, I'm happy to propose this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Harper, would you like to second and speak now or reserve your right to speak? Uh, yes, I'll second the, um, the proposal. Nothing else to add. Thank you. All right. So are there any further speakers or is that agreed? That's agreed. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, um, agenda item 13B is in relation to the draft programme of meetings for 2023 to 2024. Councillor Wayne Fitzgerald, would you like to move the recommendations? Uh, the recommendations as before us tonight, Mr Deputy Mayor, I'm happy with that. And I believe my council colleague, Steve Allen, will second. Councillor Allen, would you like to second and would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak? No, I'm happy to second and reserve my right. Thank you. Is there any further discussion or 
Or is it agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay. Right, I can't turn the pages quickly enough. No, moving so quickly. Um, right, so thank you very much. That's the end of tonight's m meeting. Um, but I, I would like to ask all councillors to remain in the ch chamber for an informal meeting, which will be chaired by the Chief Executive. At the conclusion of the informal meeting, um, unfortunately, because the de de Deputy Mayoress isn't here, we can't actually provide food for you but we are providing some crisps and some teas and coffees so i would ask you if, if you would like to join me in the mayor's parlor f following the conclusion of the informal meeting thank you very much